Our scripture reading today is from the third chapter of the Paul's letter to the Philippians. And this is from the message version of the Bible. So listen for the word of the Lord. You know my pedigree, a legitimate birth, circumcised on the eighth day, an Israelite from the elite tribe of Benjamin, a strict and devout adherent to God's law, a fiery defender of the purity of my religion, even to the point of persecuting the church, a meticulous observer of everything set down in God's law book. These very credentials these people are waving around as something special, I'm tearing up and throwing out with the trash, along with everything I else I used to take credit for. And why? Because of Christ. Yes, all the things I once thought were so important are gone from my life. Compared to the high privilege of knowing Christ Jesus as my master firsthand, everything I once thought I had going for me is insignificant, dog dung. I've dumped it all in the trash so that I could embrace Christ and be embraced by him. I didn't want some petty, inferior brand of righteousness that comes from keeping a list of rules when I could get the robust kind that comes from trusting Christ, God's righteousness. I gave up all that inferior stuff so I could know Christ personally experience his resurrection power, be a partner in his suffering, and go all the way with him to death itself. If there was any way to get in on the resurrection from the dead, I wanted to do it. I'm not saying that I have all this together, that I have it made, but I am well on my way reaching out for Christ, who has so wondrously reached out for me. Friends, don't, don't get me wrong. By no means do I count myself an expert in all of this. But I've got my eye on the goal, where God is beckoning us onward to Jesus. I'm off and running, and I'm not turning back. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So on August 1st, 2023, I started my 10th year in ministry and at Valley United Presbyterian Church. I, I can't believe it's been that long. And after nearly a decade in ministry, I sometimes reflect on my seminary education and how it did or did not prepare me for ministry. So seminary prepares you for this much of ministry. And then you step foot into your ministry setting of choice for the very first time. And you realize the scope of ministry is really this much. And when I think back on some of the pastoral care classes I took, I didn't really find them that useful. I mean, perhaps I took the wrong ones, I don't know. But maybe it was in one of those classes or it was during my student chaplaincy at Christiana Hospital in Wilmington, Delaware, which working at the hospital was literally the most formative thing I did in seminary. But whether it was in a class or it was doing student chaplaincy, I remember someone saying to me, never use the phrase, I understand, because you don't. And that was puzzling to me at the time. But here's what that meant. <coughs> Excuse me. So let me make up, a, make up an example. Maybe my best friend passed away five years ago, and I'm sitting with someone 
whose best friend just passed five minutes ago. Now, I understand what it was like to deal with my best friend passing, but I have no idea what it's like for the person that I'm sitting with. I don't know the the nuances of their relationship, how they really felt about each other, and what this loss represents for the person who's left on this side of eternity. Just because I've suffered a similar loss doesn't mean I understand all the losses that fit into the same category. Now, that being said, if someone wants to complain to me about being on prednisone, girl, I got you, I understand. I've been on it for nearly six years now, and I know that they call prednisone Satan's Tic Tacs for a reason. If you want to talk about how scary an MRI can be or how many times you were stuck for a blood draw before because your veins are weird and they couldn't get blood out, you want to talk about the frustration of having to wait so long before you could get a doctor's appointment, I have experienced all of that firsthand. And that, I feel confident in saying, I understand. And I understand is exactly where we meet Paul, near the end of his letter to the Philippians. As we talked last week, Paul had been to Philippi before he wrote this letter. (laughs) So Paul had been to Philippi before he wrote this letter, and this letter he wrote from prison. And though he was in prison several times, many scholars think he was in prison in Rome when he wrote to the church in Philippi. So at the beginning of this chapter, Paul says, and that's about it, friends. And then he goes on for two more chapters before he concludes the letter with, receive and experience the amazing grace of the master Jesus Christ, deep, deep within yourselves. Ah, what a beautiful way to end a letter. So in this passage, Paul goes into his background in detail. You know my pedigree, a legitimate birth, circumcised on the eighth day, an Israelite from the elite tribe of Benjamin, a strict and devout adherent to God's law, a fiery defender of the purity of my religion, even to the point of persecuting the church a meticulous observer of everything set down in God's law book. So Paul is citing his formerly Jewish background to prove his street cred, as the kids say, to acknowledge his conversion and to show that he he knows what he's talking about. Paul wasn't a street preacher shouting at others, follow Jesus. He was someone who believed what these people used to believe. He used to follow the laws that these people couldn't let go of. And he was someone who found his way to Christ after leaving all of that behind. So Paul's telling the Philippians they've got to let go of what was in order to embrace what was, what is, and what forever will be. And that's Jesus. So Paul is showing them what sacrifice actually looks like, and he is walking proof that sacrifice leads to a life of security in Christ. And then even after all of that, he says he doesn't consider himself an expert. So what I'm getting at here is that Paul, he was able to use the sentence I understand. He came from a life of faith without Jesus, yet he walked the walk and talked the talk. And then he found the way, the truth, and the life, and he did a spiritual 180. Friends, this is exactly what discipleship looks like. 
So we've got an evening Bible study going on right now on Tuesdays. And we've talked in that Bible study about how a life with Jesus isn't a one and done moment. Deciding to follow Christ is a beautiful moment. But it's more than just a moment. It's a, it's a lifetime, however long that might be. It's a lifetime of building a relationship with God the Creator, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And that relationship requires similar things to what an earthly relationship requires. Commitment, loyalty, devotion. But, but even that's not enough. Following Jesus requires putting God above everything else. Family, kids, partners, material things, our own health, everything. And holy cannoli, this is not easy. It is something that we are meant to wrestle with over and over again. And the Christian life is one of just that, wrestling with God. If it were all but a mere moment of saying, oh, Jesus, I believe in you, and then we threw a party afterward, I, I, I'm pretty sure every one of us would utter those words at some point in our lives. And then we'd boogie down at the party afterward. And then we'd be done with having to do any more faith work. But listen, God's got the time. God has got the time to wrestle with us. And okay, most of the time, yeah, God will win. And we're lying on the mat, looking up at God, going, oh, yeah, I, I really shouldn't have done that. You're right. Help me make more faithful decisions next time. And then God helps us. God helps us up, and we go another round. Paul was no stranger to wrestling. He spent his whole adult life wrestling with God. Okay, so I, I'm doing it this way. Now you want me to do it that way. And now you want me to suffer and teach others from prison, no less? <laughs> yeah. Paul was in a lifelong wrestling match with God. And so are we. So the next time someone is sharing a story with you about a struggle they've had, try and catch yourself before you say, I understand. Because chances are, you don't. Everyone is having their own wrestling match with something that is unique to them. And while you probably don't understand exactly what they're going through, you can come alongside them and hold them in prayer. When it comes to faith, Paul was a disciple who could legitimately say, I understand. As for the rest of us, ding, 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 a new match, a new round has started. Let's go. Amen.